Hi, I'm Prehistorica, and today I'm participating in a massive collaborative effort to bring YouTube the ultimate Paleo Rewind for 2021. With dozens of YouTubers contributing, including Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong, Keenan Taylor, Henry the Paleo Guy, and Edge himself, each month has been split in two, and each half assigned to a different content creator. In this segment, we will be covering the first half of the month of September. Be sure to check out the other contributions from other creators, and subscribe to Edge so you don't miss it when the full compilation is uploaded at the end. Now, what am I gonna cover? There's one thing this video needs. Kicking off the month, we have a topical new discovery from the Cambrian of Utah. While the Cambrian is most famous for the fauna of the Burgess Shale, Lagerstaden from the time exist all around the world, with multiple localities specifically in the American state of Utah. The Margem Formation of Western Utah, nestled into the House Range Mountains, preserves a fauna from the Laurentian Sea, near the Burgess Shale, dating back to roughly the same time. 506 million years ago, give or take a few million. The sea was relatively shallow, the fauna was composed of many animals also common to the British Shale, including an indeterminate species of Herdia, a uh, sweet feeding herded, uh, Osha disjuncta, an onteranost acorn worm that lived in finely built collagen tubes. Earlier this year, in January, they also described a new genus of herded, Bucospinia cooperi which was previously only identified as a new species of herded with an enormous mouth. On September 6th, we got a new genus of Paleoscolecid worm, the first known from the formation, called Arachiscolexaci, named after the armored sandworms of Frank Herbert's novel Dune, which lived on planet Arrakis, as well as after the collector who discovered the fossils of the worm, Arvid Aze. The worm, which sported an armor sclerotome of densely packed, tiny, node-like plates, was rare, or rarely preserved. This is in line with several other Cambrian Lagerstaten of the Laurentian coast, and perhaps demonstrates that different taphonomic controls affected the preservation of paleoskeletic worms during the Cambrian. Published on the same day as Arrakis Golex, I would be remiss not to mention the detailed analysis of face-biting in Tyrannosaurs, a common component of intraspecific combat among some archosaurs. This study looked at 202 different Tyrannosaurid specimens, and discovered a total of 324 different facial biting lesions, wounds left behind when two Tyrannosaurs gave each other what some might consider to be the world's meanest, bloodiest kiss. They found that the scars were frequently found in the same places on the skull, suggesting that biting was almost ritualistic, like the rutting of deer, only with far more gore. The wounds are absent in the youngest specimens and begin to show up as the Tyrannosaur entered sexual maturity, indicating that this behavior was probably practiced among similarly aged males competing between each other for mates. Roughly 60% of adults had some kind of facial lesion. Taken together, the life of a hormonal Tyrannosaur teen was painted in blood, and many took these scars into adulthood. Among dinosaurs, this practice of violent intraspecific combat was largely phased out with the development of feathers, which could be used for displays. But among archosaurs, it still exists in crocodiles and alligators. Next on our list, we head to the Cambrian Burgess Shale, for a discovery that I, and a few other Cambrian nerds, had been patiently waiting for since early 2019. Titanocores Gainsey, also known as the Mothership, 
is an enormous, stout-bodied herded, and a close relative of Camboraster Folcatus, which was discovered around the same time. Reaching a length of roughly half a meter long, it was one of the largest animals ever discovered in the Burgess Shale, rivaling the almost equally long Anomalocaris canadensis. While neither it nor Anomalocaris canadensis were even close to the largest animals alive during the Cambrian, the mothership was still one of the Burgess Shale's largest predators. It was a sweet feeder, like Camboraster and Herdia, using their appendages like fine combs to rake soft-bodied prey like worms or molting trilobites out of the sediment before passing it to the spiny mouth on the bottom of the head. The description of Camboraster came in 2019, as its fossils easily beat out Titanicores in quantity and quality. The description of Titanicores, then, was long-awaited, and helmed by the same two scientists, Joe Moisiuk and Dr. Jean-Bernard Caron from the Royal Ontario Museum. It was known as the Mothership during field excavations, just as the smaller Camboraster was called the Spaceship. Later, it was originally going to be named Megaraster, in reference to its giant head and as a complement to Camboraster. The name was changed to Titanicores, meaning Titan's Helmet, to better reflect the material. The specific epithet, Gainsey, is in honour of Dr. Robert Gaines, who helped during field expeditions at the Canadian Fossil Site and conducted numerous studies to better understand the environment and taphonomic conditions of the Burgess Shale. Some of the best material, including a large, well-preserved head shield, and a head shield that served as the holotype covered in agnostids feeding on the remains, are now on display at the ROM's new gallery, Dawn of Life, which opened in December. In our next piece of invertebrate news, we go back to the Cambrian of Utah, to a different site this time. The Spence Shale, discovered by Charles Walcott of Burgess Shale fame in 1908, dates back to roughly the same age as both the Burgess and Margin localities. It is home to a host of Cambrian fauna most typical, such as indeterminate herdids, a species of anomalocarid, and uniquely the only described American lobopodian, a Cynocrychus stichus, a heavily armored Collinsivermid, Collins monster, with hundreds of spines lining its body in whorls. On September 21st, a new discovery was published. A single fossil of Waptia, a small shrimp-like arthropod, with eggs preserved in three dimensions. The fossil was collected by the Gunther family and came from a site called Miner's Hollow. While initially unexceptional, aside from being a 506 million year old soft-bodied arthropod fossil, the specimen was recently probed with x-rays, using a machine called a synchrotron. Literally, they stuck a 506 million year old bug fossil from Utah inside a giant fourth generation particle accelerator in France to look at its eggs using an x-ray 100 billion times more powerful than the ones they use in hospitals. One of the eggs actually came loose, so they glued it to the end of a toothpick, and then stuck it inside of a particle accelerator. All of this actually happened. Anyway, the results, unsurprisingly, are detailed. Of the roughly 18 eggs preserved in the cluster, which would have been tucked under the carapace in life, 11 are preserved in three dimensions, in various states of decay. The mother, an indeterminate species of Waptia, was 8 centimeters long. The eggs themselves are, on average, about a millimeter wide. Details revealed by the particle accelerator include the exact mineral composition of each part of the egg, an area possibly corresponding to the yolk, a jelly-like membrane around the egg, and a part of that membrane that likely attached to the carapace of the mother. The inside of the egg was weakly acidic, full of phosphorus and other minerals. The eggs were at different stages of development at the time of burial, leading to the different internal chemical compositions. Lastly, to end off this year's invertebrate special, we go to the Ordovician of Spain. Here we find a species of average-sized trilobite called Placaparia cambriensis. 
This trilobite was completely blind, and survived by bringing small suspended food particles into a feeding chamber under the head. The cephalon protected the appendages close to the head, and also helped generate a weak vortex to drag in food particles. Interestingly, a team from Bogota, Colombia and Madrid, Spain, looked into the life of Placoparia using a technique called Fluid Dynamic Simulation. They used a model of Placoparia's exoskeleton, complemented by trace fossil evidence, to investigate exactly how Placoparia integrated with its physical environment. They found that, just like some modern marine arthropods, Placoparia engaged in a kind of hopping motion, or underwater punting as it's called. While it was unable to swim, it was able to frequently leap up into the water from a substrate by kicking off from its back legs, before being dragged back down by the fluid. A hop. It probably did this to escape predators, primarily. This kind of hopping motion had previously been hypothesized for monomorphicness, a trace fossil as old as the Cambrian, suggested to have been made by an arthropod trying to stabilize itself. It also explains tiny differences in leg counts in trilobite walking traces, diplocnites. Differences in speed or water flow over the body of the trilobite affected the number of posterior legs that made contact with the substrate. At lower speeds, the back legs touched the ground, but at higher speeds, they were raised off the sediment, leading to a variety of conditions for walking traces left by even the same species of trilobite. Alright, I think I got it all covered for the cool invertebrate news. Uh, thanks to Edge for having me, and for the next half of September, be sure to visit the Cretaceous cast to hear about dinosaur tail wagging, two new spinosaurids from the UK, uh, one of my favorite dinosaur fossils, Scipionics, and more. As for me, well, I'll see you in like, I don't know, half a year.